Hey there, coaches. I'm Rich Prado, owner of Play in School and host of Travel Ball Talk, where I talk to travel ball coaches from the best organizations about the current and future state of travel baseball. Today's episode features Jim Osting, the founder and owner of Ostinger's Baseball near Tampa, Florida. Jim is the classic example of the 10-year overnight success. He's been steadily and slowly building his organization for the last decade, and all of a sudden, the Ostingers are near the top of the rankings at every age group. I hope you enjoy this episode of Travel Ball Talk. All right, welcome back to another episode of Travel Ball Talk. Today we head down to Lithia, Florida, which is which is in Hillsborough County, which is a suburb of, of Tampa, if you will, and we're talking to Jim Osting of Ostingers Academy, Ostingers Baseball. If you've been following Travel Ball for the last couple of years, this is a name you recognize. Uh, I, I would describe them as a as a smaller organization that is taking Travel Ball by storm. Uh, so, Jim, uh, welcome to the show. How are you doing, man? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. I, I, you know, I, I said that Ostingers is it, it's becoming a known name. I've been following along you guys for, for a little while, and, and at first it was kind of like, you know, who are these guys? Uh, they, seem to be, they seem to be competing at a high level, and then all of a sudden, you know, a couple years later, you guys are, you guys are kind of in the conversation at the top of a ton of, a ton of events. So we're going to talk about that. We will go and talk about kind of the background and how you got from where you were to where you are. Um, but I think the first thing I want to do before we before we get into that is is kind of get to know you for a few minutes. So um, why don't you why don't you give the listeners uh, a brief taste of of your background and bio, and then also then we can lead right into how O Stingers got started, and then we'll go from there. Sure. Um, I man, I don't know how far back you want to go, but, um, well, we all play you know, T-ball, probably... so, so you don't have to go back there. <laughs> I was going to say we all played, you know, at that little league level, you know, guys, guys, my age probably weren't really introduced to the travel ball scene until maybe high school Legion ball time frame. Um, my, believe it or not, my, my little league team won the state tournament in Kentucky, um, growing up in Louisville. Uh, we won the state tournament my 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15-year-old years. So we were Kentucky State champions five years in a row. Oh, that was probably um, a fun experience. Yeah, it was fun. We, My older brother um, was 12. I was 11 on our Little League team that we were one game away from Williamsport um, back in the day when there was only four regions and we had to come to Florida and it was a single elimination tournament. And we actually got beat by Jim Abbott's little brother. Huh. Um, so it was from Texas. So we lost three to nothing in the, the regional final game that would have taken one of four teams to the, uh, to Williamsport in the Little League World Series. So that was, that was a really cool experience. Yeah. How, um, how old are you so currently? I am 40. I'm 42. Okay. Okay. So that gives us a time frame of, of when that was cool. Yeah. Um, so late eighties, um, little league player. And, um, believe it or not. And during that time frame in little league coaches could not coach the bases. So I was one of 14 players on the team, but probably number 12, 13 or 14. Uh -huh. Um, we did not have minimum play rules in little league. So we probably played 35 all-star games in about a month, month and a half span. And I probably got 15 to 20 at bats total. Um, I was a catcher. I was the second string catcher. And I was the all time third base coach. So, <laughs> so your coaching, your coaching days got started way back at 11. At 11. Absolutely. Uh, outstanding. Um, outstanding. I, love I, it. I will, I will claim that I was the best third base, third base coach in Little League that year. Um, I believe it. I felt like, I don't know. I just, I took ownership of it. You know, I, I realized that was going to kind of be my spot on the team. And, you know, my, my older brother was on the team and the team was really, really good. Um, and I was one of three 11 year olds on the team and 
I just saw, you know what, this is going to be my little niche and this is what, what I'm going to be able to do to help the team win and kind of took that and ran with it. And so that was my, I guess my little league years, um, realized that probably 13 or 14, that being a left-handed catcher was not going to be <laughs> an area of expertise for me. So, uh, <clears throat> I kind of put the gear away and started th- throwing and pitching and, um, I, I turned into a pretty decent little pitcher. I was very skinny, lanky, um, growing up, but, uh, my, my, uh, again, my older brother was on a travel ball team out of Lexington, Kentucky called Lexington Dixie. Um, Tommy Brooks was our coach who's kind of well known in the travel arena. Um, it has had some really good teams over the years. My older brother made that team and kind of through, through workings of being on that team, my, my brother and my dad kind of said, Hey, I, you know, got a little brother over here that might, you might help the team. So I worked out and coach Brooks basically said, you know what, he can be on this team. He's not going to pitch. He's not going to do much, but um, we'll let him be on the team. We'll let him, you know, practice, compete and that sort of thing. So um, I kind of started off doing midweek games, kind of like college. You know, you kind of get your midweek guys out there and they kind of get their feet wet and that sort of thing. And then the midweek guy turned into, uh, hey, I know you're only 15, but I'm going to let you go pitch against this 18-year-old team. Well, seven innings and 16 strikeouts later, I was I kind of turned into the ace. Mm. Um, and I don't know if it was because I was below hitting speed or what, <laughs> but – um, that, that outing against the 18 year old team as a 15 year old kind of started, I guess, what was my recruiting slash getting drafted the whole nine yards. So, um, you know, went through the travel ball ranks, went to Louisville Trinity high school, um, was drafted out of there in 1995 in the fourth round by the Braves, um, Hep Cronin legendary scout was was my scout um committed to go to clemson but um just you know as a pitcher getting that drafted that high yeah you know myself and family basically decided it was probably of of best interest to kind of move to pro ball and see where it took me and you know as your dream of being a big leaguer you know and you getting drafted you know that the chances of that happening are much better getting to your dreams, um, you know, as you get drafted out of high school and, you know, obviously with the Braves at that time, you know, having Glavin and Maddox and Avery and Smoltz and, you know, Leo Mazzoni as the pitching coach and that sort of thing, that was a big draw for me knowing, you know, I was going to learn and be taught by some of the best names and, you know, greatest pitchers in baseball history. So um, kind of went in that direction. Um you know, worked through the minor leagues, uh, was a, was a minor Atlanta Braves, uh, minor league pitcher of the year, um, in 1999. Um, and then through, you know, the business of baseball was traded, you know, at the July trade deadline for Andy Ashby. Um, I went to the Phillies organization, um, then bounced around and, you know, being a left-handed pitcher, that's, kind of a commodity um i actually made it to the major leagues with the um the san diego padres and then pitched in the big leagues with milwaukee brewers as well pretty several cool. organizations mixed up in there too you know i was with the rockies for a couple weeks yeah um, i was with the rays so yeah you, good you, times you, you know on one hand you you look back and you go man what the heck nobody wants me and the other on the other hand Everybody wants you. They, yeah, they found exactly. they they found enough uh, value in you. They said this 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 player is a pretty good player. We can use him to in return for somebody else. You know, so absolutely. So, yeah. um, kind of glass half full uh, version of looking at that. And so you, you and there goes my phone. Hang on, I thought that was quiet. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, the um. You, you made it up for a variety of cups of coffee with different teams. Yeah. And it, at some point, 
you know, like everybody else comes to an end and uh, you retire or they retire you. And then you're sitting around wondering what's next. How'd you, how'd you transition from pro, pro ball to whatever was next? And what, what was that for you? Yeah. So for me, um, I was always a student of the game. Um, I wasn't a guy that threw 95 miles an hour um, in the era of the game that I played. Um, un- unfortunately, performance enhancing drugs was a big part of the game yeah. um, that, that I did not partake in. Um, but at the end of the day, I feel like that was part of the reason my career ended when it did. Um, just seeing guys pass me up that were being aided in one way or the other. Um, that just wasn't something I was going to do, but, um, you know, as, as I, the winners of my playing career, um, either spending it in Louisville, Kentucky or making Georgia or, you know, various different locations, I, I kind of enjoyed working with younger kids during the off seasons and just, you know, whether it's donating your time or just, you know, making a little, a little money during the off season when you're not getting paid. Yeah. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. So when my playing career ended, I kind of said, you know, I'm going to take a stab at, you know, just working with kids. And um, I guess my area here in Florida, I, you know, I moved shortly after playing to the Tampa area and just to kind of see how it would be and uh you know one or two lessons at the little league turned into hmm. 15 or 20 and 15 or 20 turned into 50 yeah and then 50 turned into you know what i better get a little place so when it rains you yeah. know for three or four months a year i've got a place to do these lessons and you know one of the dads is like you know you should really dive into coaching a team i think these kids would really love to play for you so um, and that, and when you, one, when you went from a, f- a few lessons to all of a sudden you're at say 50 lessons, are we talking about 10 to 12 years ago? Yeah, we're, um, we, I've been in the facility that we're in currently. I've been there for 10 years. So, okay. so a decade, um, yeah. I, I, yep, I've been, uh, I've been kind of out of the game for probably 14 or 15 years, mm-hmm. um, where, you know, the, the first few years was, you know, at the league and just kind of, you know, doing coaches clinics on weekends, trying to help rec ball coaches and teach them the correct things to teach. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, when we got the facility 10 and a half, 11 years ago is, is kind of when I started dabbling into the team thing and the team thing just kind of has, has exploded into, you know, an organization, so to speak. So, and it, and it was literally um, one, one parent comes to you and says, Hey, I think, I think you need to run a team. Yeah, it was. I mean, it really was, it was, uh, it was that, and it was turned into, you know, the parents were, you know, I think they liked my teaching style of, you know, pushing a kid, you know, knowing that you can get more out of a kid. And I think that that's something that they gravitated towards and, you know, ultimately kind of got me started with one team. And, um, and then from there, what age group was that real quick? That was, that was thir- that was a league age 13 team. So that was the first year going on the big field, you know, of really like oh, yeah, learning that's... what a double cutoff is yeah. and learning, holy cow, I'm throwing a ball 60 feet, six inches instead of 50 feet. And yeah. You know, I I have to back up bases because if they overthrow, it's not going to hit the fence that's five feet behind third. It's going to hit a fence that's thirty feet behind third. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. It's a big it's a big transition. So you go Absolutely. from you go from one team ten years ago, and now you have teams from eight U all the way up. So talk Correct. talk to me about that. When you know we had traded some text messages, you were you had talked about how you. Hey, you've built this thing kind of slowly but surely over over the course of ten years. So talk talk about how you added, you know, a team at age each age group. Let's take a short break from this call to talk about my day job, video. In 2019, if you aren't leveraging film to market your guys, 
you are doing them a disservice. So where do I come in? Well, filming one guy on your iPhone and texting it to coaches or posting it to Twitter is easy. But filming 25, 50, 100, or 200 is really hard. And that's why you haven't done it already. That's why smart coaches partner with Play In School. We do all the work. We come to you. We can film 100 guys in the time it would take you to film just four or five. If you'd like to see every team we partner with, visit playinschool.com slash teams. Contact me today to discuss the details. Now, back to the call. Yeah, so we, we at that 13-year-old age group, you know, I, I kind of kept it at that one team for a year or two. Um, and then that team kind of got to the high school age and – you know, one of the high school coaches in the area kind of asked, hey, coach, would you come out and, you know, work with our pitchers? And, you know, I, I kind of took that on and said, you know, I'd really like to. Um, and then I realized in the one year that I was a high school pitching coach that not all high school players want to play at the next level. Yep. So for me, that was really tough working with kids that were, they were just there because it was a, you know, the cool thing and a status thing at their high school, you know, but then I saw other kids that, that really, really wanted to get to the next level. But in the, in the state of the game now, you know, the high school coaches, some of them are great, unbelievable high school coaches, but you know, the, the college coaches don't necessarily go directly to a high school coach to get information. So there was this disconnect of, you know, hey, this kid really wants to play at the next level. This kid's good enough to play at the next level, but how are they going to do it if they're just playing this the high school ball? So we kind of turned, you know, turned that into a a 16 and 18 year old team, um, and that 16 and 18 year old team kind of turned into a, you know, a 15, 16, 17, and 18 year old program. Um, and then in, in uh, a league here close in, in Lithia, um, in the Fishhawk area, um, basically asked me to come and basically start a travel ball program for, for the park here. So um, we kind of, we, we basically started at that. And my, vi- my vision of travel ball, which is probably not the most profitable um, or business savvy way of doing travel ball is I feel like there should be one team, the best of the best kids try out per age group. Mm. So the travel ball program that I run, which is called the Fishhawk Wolves between eight and 12, they have one team per age group. Um, you know, we might have 30 or 40 kids try out for that team. We probably have plenty of players to play in that you know to to make probably two maybe even three teams but um you know it, it's my vision that of you know what travel ball should be the best of the best mm-hmm. and if if you're one of the kids that's left off this team you know hey work hard you know the, these you know i offer them you know hey I'll, I'll give you all the information that we took as coaches and the panel that picked the team mm-hmm. and these are the things that you fell short on you know, work on those over the next six months and come back out and try out again. We have two trials every year for every age group that I coach. Um, and I do that for several reasons. I, you know, parents might not be happy with the coaching or play time or how the organization is run. And to me, that gives them, you know, after that season, that gives them the way out. Um, and then for us as coaches and a program, you know, if it's not a good fit, then, you know, it gives everybody a chance to say, you know what, we're not cutting you in the middle of the season. You don't have to leave in the middle of the season. We're not teaching you how to be a quitter, you know, stick it out for the rest of the year. And as soon as this season's over, you know, you can go your own way and we'll go ours. And, you know, that's, I feel like that is a better structure than, you know, when you sign up, you're signing up for a 12 month period, you know, you're going to pay X number of hundred dollars a month. And whether we play three times or zero times during that mm-hmm. month, that's the amount you pay. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Some of that I just feel like is not fair or 
you, slightly wrong. Are you? Are you? So. so one team at each age group. Yeah, that that definitely is. Uh, that's not how you're seeing a lot of the groups do it. Would you consider yeah. adding? Um, I I only want to add. I do. I I do consider it often. Um, I only want to add though when I feel like it's teams that are going to be competitive yeah. and teams that are made up of players that know that they want to get better. Yeah. Um, and I, and I feel like that, that would definitely be a way to, um, you know, grow the program. Um, I, you know, at the, at the older ages, I find it very difficult when you know the, some of these programs have six and eight and ten teams per age group well i mean a college coach is only coming to watch your best team yeah you know maybe maybe if it's a really large program maybe their second best team mm -hmm. um and so for for me at my in in Ostingers, you know we we do have two teams at the at that like freshman age just because you know some of those kids are developing at a certain rate while other ones might be just a hair a step behind but they're going to catch up so we don't want to lose some of those guys that are you know on the puberty scale just haven't gotten to where yeah. some of the other kids have yeah um, and you, you look up two years later and a couple of those kids who were undersized at the time are now the best players around some of the best players yeah. absolutely absolutely so that's that's definitely in the works of, of building the program. But again, I only want to build the program yeah. if the clientele of player yeah. is good enough to keep what we've established as a quality program. And a coach knows when they come watch an Ostingers team play, yeah. they're going to watch a really good baseball team with good baseball players that know how to play the game the right way. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my, um, my two cents and, and how I kind of wrapped my head around it. I, I used to not, necessarily love when you saw the organization with tons of teams at each age group and um and, and i've changed my my tune a little bit where listen if they don't play for you they're going to play for somebody else and so if we sure. can if we can give them an opportunity um then you know then then it's not negative the the thing that i think if you're gonna if you're gonna have multiple teams and, and you're probably not going to go from one team to like eight teams at each age group overnight. Right. Uh, sure. and, and I know, I know programs like that. Um, but, but there has to be, I think some transparency about, Hey, this is, this is the top team and these other teams. Here's, here's, you know, why you're on that team and here's our goals for you. Um, and the, and the, and the goals for the team and the expectations, Right, like if the if the kids on the third team think that they are the the team that's going to fly around the country and uh, and and play in the top events, um, they're going to be disappointed when they find out maybe they're just sure. a, more of a, a local and regional team. Uh, right. you, you, you know, so I think if you can approach it with with honesty and transparency and appropriate goals and expectations, then I, I think you'll find that, that, uh, the growing won't necessarily be uh, a bad thing. Um, uh, is, you know, but again, that, that, that puts, that puts some of the responsibility on mom and dad too. Uh, they, sure. they have to appreciate what they're getting into and they have to have some, a little bit of, um, um, realistic expectations. Yeah, yeah, and they have to kind of self-evaluate a little bit and, and understand. Hey, wait. So, I may, if I'm not going to be on the top team with with the Ostingers, would I be on the top team with this other organization? You know, prob, prob, maybe, probably not. Maybe not. You, you know what I mean? So, so um, you do see those kids, right? If I'm not on the top team, I'm leaving or I'm going somewhere else. You see that all the time, and and it's only after they. Uh, they they try and uh, jump to where they think the grass is greener. Do they sometimes realize that they're just not a top tier guy, and that's okay because there's only so many top tier colleges, and then you and then you drop down a level. Um, interesting stuff, man. I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna follow your progress over the next couple of years and see if you make a make the move from 
you're basically one team at each level to to two teams at each level and then see how that goes sure. or what you what, what i could i could totally see happening is you just keep adding at that 15u level so you, if you go yeah. if you've got two at 15u then next year you'll have two at 16u and 15u right. and then the next sure. year you'll have two at 15 16 and 17 you could do that and just add one team per year over the next sure. few years um, right. and then and then the you know the excesses of the additional uh, work that's required to run those won't won't overwhelm you, and hopefully you can maintain yeah. maintain a staff that's going to be at the level you want. Because that's the thing a, a lot that's, of people don't understand. That's a huge. That was the next thing about to come out of my mouth. Yeah, you know the, these <clears throat> being being able to find a quality coach that unfortunately we didn't sign up to be co- coaches and make millions of dollars. You know, um, and that's tough to find a quality coach that wants to be there for the right reasons and help teach the game the right way and not easy to find. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely, it's a, it's one of the most important parts of this type of business. And yes, it's a business and um, you know, you you see programs doing it differently. Uh, One of the neat things that, that I see that that's, that seems like it's a good idea. And and I guess I I don't really, uh, I guess, some people have different opinions, but I like when you, you stick a coach with that 15 U crew and then they move up, they graduate. And then next year they're the 16. And then next year they're the 17. I've seen, I've seen coaches go from youth from really young and stay with that core group of players all the way through. That seems pretty cool. There's some continuity to it. There's, um, sure. you know, the, the, the families know who, what they're getting and who they're getting and they, and they stick with that. Um, you know, the other, the other way is that, Hey, this, this is our 15 U coach. He's going to do 15 every single year. And that's that. Um, so anywho, that's a, that's a lot of good stuff, man. You're going to be, you're going to be, I can tell you can, you're going to be putting a lot of thought into this, whether to grow, whether to stay. Um, and it is a big decision and it's not a right or wrong, is it? Um, so I do want to, we, we had talked the other day about, one of the things we get we we get into this, um, and we're kind of changing topics here a little bit. But if we get into this topic a lot this year about this concept of development, and when we brought that kind of that term up the other day, you you went straight to um, this concept of making your practices as game like as possible and i'll say hey just stop right there wait explain that when we're when we're recording so i'd I'd love for you to talk about the your development side of the of the game and and how you are kind of putting some pressure on your guys in practice what's that look like yeah so um i'm i'm a pretty old school coach slash manager um you know our guys wear the uniforms the same way we all wear stirrups we all wear high high pants um so with that kind of being said you know i'm not necessarily a drill sergeant um but i you know i expect certain things done a certain way and so that's kind of how the structure of our practice starts and kind of finishes we're always hey this is there, there's a certain way to do these things here this is how we do it um you know and and in our program we also you know, I, I'm fortunate enough to have players that are from a very small radius. I mean, we have every single player that plays for me is within 20 miles of where we are, um, which is, you know, for, for teams that are nationally ranked in the top 10 and 15, you know, have kids from, you know, a 20 mile radius is a pretty, yeah. pretty special thing. Yes, so it is. Um, because of that, we're able to practice because of that, we're able to teach what I feel like is the finer things of baseball, you know, bunt plays, first and third plays. How do you do a rundown? Um, You know, just not showing up at a tournament that's six states away and you're meeting your, you know, your shortstop for the first time, um, you know, in batting practice an hour before the game starts. So um, that for that, I'm very fortunate for our program. Um, But, and because of that, you know, our, our practice structure, is I I feel like we try to make it as game like like you just said as possible, and when we run what we would call a drill, 
you know, we really focus on, you know, how do we make this, how do we get these kids to run this as game speed as possible? Because, you know, we can sit there and go, okay, this is our, you know, you need to know these three bunt plays and you need to know them one, two, and three. And, you know, we're going to go out and we're going to run them, you know, and you're going to stand on the mound as the pitcher and you're going to run bunt play one, you're going to run bunt play two, and you're going to run bunt play three, you know, and then the next guy's going to go out there and he's going to run bunt play one, bunt play two, and bunt play three. Well, then the game happens and then all of a sudden we got to go run bunt play three and they don't remember how to get to bump play three because they didn't run bump play one and bump play two before they ran bump play mm-hmm. three. So yeah. um, we, we've kind of instilled this <clears throat> making everything a game um, concept into our drills. Um, so those are the team defensive drills that we really focus on. You know, we, we have base runners out there. The base runners don't know what the play is. Um, you know, we have a hitter in the box that's actually bunting, you know, that the players have to run the bunt play as it's a game. It's not just, you know, the pitcher fakes a throw and a coach rolls the ball out there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so that I feel like has really instilled, you know, the understanding of the game and how to run it at a game speed instead of a practice speed, so to speak. But when you have base runners out there, it's a big deal. Um, you know, and then that's kind of team stuff. And then individually we'll, you know, we, we take batting practice and, you know, my son's 12 right now. And when we take batting practice, you know, we're instilling this competitive nature in, in the kids of, you know, you're not just getting eight swings in this round, you know, we're going to take eight swings and we're going to, we're going to work on hitting behind the runner. We're going to work on hitting the ball opposite field. You know, so, you know, we'll keep score. You know, how many times did you hit a ball hard to the opposite field? You know, so then we kind of keep a running total through batting practice of, you know, competition. You know, I I feel like that's something that we're losing in today's world of, you know, everybody gets a participation trophy that, you know, we just show up, everybody makes a team, you know, yeah, we have tryouts, but you know, there's, there's 60 kids here, but all 60 kids make one of the teams. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I feel like that's the competitive nature of what we're, our program is trying to teach, which then on the weekends at the younger ages, and then, you know, during the summer and the fall at the older high school ages, when these kids step out on the field, they know what it is to compete, you know, a, a, a pitcher throws a bullpen. Yes, he goes and throws a bullpen. You know, in certain bullpens, we're, we're facing batters the whole bullpen. You know, might not necessarily be hitting, you know, but there's a batter in the box with a bat standing there, and this kid's got to go make pitches, and we're keeping counts and everything else to where that kid's not just standing on a mound throwing into a net or throwing mm-hmm. to a catcher. And oh my my thirty my thirty five pitches is up I'm done yeah. and he walks off the mound. You know there are times and places for those types of bullpens. Don't get me wrong, but there's also a, an element of you didn't do anything there. You didn't compete in that bullpen. So you know we're just really trying to teach that competitive edge all the time, which has really helped us out in the summer times in the fall of going out against no matter who we play, you know, no matter what uniforms in the other dugout, you know, these kids know that they got to go compete. And that's kind of our, our motto. This is, this is unbelievably refreshing in the age of, uh, you know, the quote unquote showcase guy, which we all, we all intuitively know what that means, right? The the kid can go out there and, and uh, you know, field six ground balls and and chuck it across a diamond and and take one round of BP and 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 look like a ball player doing that, versus the kid who can go in a game and know you know know what to do, when to do it, and how to look like an actual baseball player. It, this is sure. that that's this is totally amazing. I mean, you know, so I'm I'm not all hung up in rankings and and that stuff except for when you're ranked at the top and uh, the O Stinger uh, clubs are ranked towards the top um, by those big companies that rank 
you know, players and teams. And so if you've got a bunch of top ranked teams competing against each other often at practice, when they go off to play in the weekend or week long events, well, they've been competing against players or I mean, some of those games are probably not against players who are half as good as the kids they practice with. So that's that's kind of awesome. <laughs> that is that yeah. is kind of kind of awesome. Um, and not only that, they know they know what you know the the bunt D one versus bunt D three looks like. And and my gosh, that's you, you know when you when you're playing a tournament that matters and people start laying down bunts and start stealing, you can see the teams that that aren't aren't ready for that. You can tell. You sure. can you, you see that a mile away. That this is very cool. I'm yeah. glad I'm glad we spoke about this. Um I can I can imagine a, uh, somebody listening going we we need to we need to uh turn the dial up at practice. You know, cuz especially that that example about the bullpens. You can totally envision a kid going, "Hey, hey, today's your day to throw." And he grabs a ball, he grabs a catcher or a net goes down the line and it's like an autopilot right yep. he, he goes and throws his 30 pitches but they were it's like you weren't even there it was just your body took over you threw 30 pitches and you're done and yeah you broke a sweat but doing that compared to throwing 30 pitches against a real hitter with counts um and yeah it's not a real game but it but it but the but the dial feels like it's it's a little little higher than just throwing into a, a net. It's it's pretty cool stuff, man. And one of the things I really I found when you when you got into that, you know, kids can throw strikes with no batter in the box, you know, and you've got a catcher there, and they're probably throwing it at what they might feel like is a hundred percent, but it's probably more like seventy. Right. You know, then then you turn the lights on, so to speak, and then you yep. put a a hitter in the box and it's a, a uniform that's a different uniform than yours and you got an umpire back there and all of a sudden we're keeping score and we have a count and you know i'm not going to throw five change-ups in a row like i did in the bullpen and yeah. finally on the fifth one i threw one good change up out of five yeah you know yeah. um so so then consequently you know, our strike ratio increased just because we were competing in bullpens because a kid knew how to go at it harder or yeah. faster, however you want to call that, yeah. you know, yeah. during a bullpen session. So More intense. For sure. This this yeah, uh, this is this is a really this is a really good um a really good discussion. It's like you you want to you want to practice how you play. And that's easier said than done. Yeah. And it makes so it much is. sense when you say it, but then to hear it put into actual practice, you go, oh, now I get it. Very cool. Um, good stuff, man. I'm, I'm happy you're, I'm happy you're able to do that. And that's one of the benefits of having guys that live close that allows you to have actual practices. Um, good stuff. Now, one of the things that, that you also mentioned when we were uh, trading some taxes is you, you you describe it as in the recruiting process, there are some things that you feel like you do a little bit differently than some, some organizations, and you kind of left it at that. So I'm, I'm super curious um, what you meant by that. So we'll, we'll, we'll continue talking about this older age group um, and specifically about this, this recruiting. How is uh, O-Stinger baseball different than some of the other clubs? as far as the recruiting process i mean uh, for i mean i i being who i am playing where i've played knowing what it takes to get to that level um i'm probably well there's no probably i am the toughest critic on my players Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and i and i you know i take that you know and i think that there's a respect level from my players to me and then there's a respect level from me to my players. Mm-hmm. They know they know that Coach Osting is, you know, going to stay on them about their grades. They know Coach Osting is not going to let them, you know, show up to the park with their hat turned on backwards. And, you know, th- those, you know, small examples, but in the overall character of, a, of the makeup of a player, you know, 
baseball is going to end one day. And at some point you need to become a man. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's part of our program. Um, And I, I think that is kind of, part of how we do our recruiting process for our players. Um, You know, the national average of high school players that play at the collegiate level is 7% based in base in the sport of baseball. Um, Our, our program over the last nine years has over 90% of our guys that play college baseball. Um, You know, I'm sure there's programs that have a hundred percent, you know, that have kids from all over the country on one team. But, you know, from a team that's local, so to speak, I I feel like there's not very many people that can say that there's 90% of their kids are playing college baseball year in and year out. So I feel like our, our model works. Um, and I'm all about trying to find the best fit for a player. Um, and sometimes players don't necessarily know what that fit is, Mm -hmm. you know, being in Florida, you know, every kid grows up, you know, putting on a Florida Gator or a, you know, Florida state Seminoles or a Miami hurricanes or a UCF or a USF or, Mm -hmm. you know, a Jacksonville, which are, you know, all unbelievable baseball programs being in the state of Florida at the division one level. Um, but not every player is, is a good fit for those types of programs. Um, you know, if you, if you look at the NCAA portal now, you know, there's, there's so many, what we call in the, in the industry, we call them bounce backs. You know, mm-hmm. they go to a division one program for a semester. They realize, Hey, you know, <clears throat> coach sold me a bill of goods, told me how, you know, I was going to come in here and I was going to be the starting shortstop and this, that, and the other. And then I show up and there's eight shortstops here. And I'm, I'm either just a pitcher now, or, you know, they've moved me to left field or I'm never going to get on the field or, you know, heck coach is going to cut me in six months. So, Mm -hmm. um, I kind of understand that process. Not that everybody doesn't, but for my program, you know, is it great? And we do, we have players at the division one level at the high, you know, at the high end D one schools, absolutely hundred percent do, but not every player is that guy. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I, we, as, as a program do a pretty good job of making sure that the player understands who he is and where he's going to be most successful. And then, you know, what's the fit, you know, academically, what are you looking to do? You know, we have, in my program, there's some very high academic players um, that, you know, engineering schools. I mean, there's, you know, every school doesn't have engineering, mm-hmm. you know, so you've got to find the right fit for that player that, you know, like I said, at the end of the day, at some point, baseball is going to end and you don't want to be three or four years behind in your schooling that you're going to go have to pay more money to go get your schooling after baseball is over just because you wanted to play baseball. Mm-hmm. So in our, in our grand scheme of recruiting, it's, it's about finding the right fit for the player. And it's about finding the right player for the fit of the university. Yeah. And um, over the last eight to 10 years, I feel like the Rolodex for OBA is, has become pretty, pretty robust and, um, the, you know, the guys that go and play at the next level are, are basically my advertisement advertisement mm-hmm. for the program. When they get there, they know how to practice, yeah. you know, they know what bunt plays are, you know, those bunt plays might change slightly, but you know, they know what baseball is. They're not just that showcase player that shows up and, you know, they don't know how to win, you know, a college coach gets paid on, does he win or not? If he doesn't yeah. win at some point, his job is gone. It is. You know, and I and I think that the coaches that recruit OBA, Ostinger players, they know that what they're getting when they get them. They know that they're going to be hard-nosed, blue-collar, work their tail off, good academics, uh, you know, student athletes, you know, good teammates. Um, you, you just, you just that, answered a question uh, before I – before I answered it, I've been asking a lot of the guests lately how they would, how college coaches would describe uh, their players, and I th- and you just did that. Uh, so thanks for uh, th- thanks for reading my mind on that one. That's 
That's good stuff, man. It, there's, there's so much good stuff in there. Um, you, you know, one of the first things I thought of when you were talking about how, how you're, you know, you're tough on your guys and, um, and you're tougher on them than, than, than maybe anybody else. Um, God, I'm thinking about how, what, how it negatively impacts a player and a program when a travel or high school coach oversells a player. It doesn't like they think they're helping their kid out, right? Right. And they've got they, right. they got this kid. He's okay. He's good. But then they're they're selling, 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 and somebody you know a program that's a little above that kid's head takes takes a chance on him, and then guess what? It doesn't help the program. Doesn't help the kid. And that's a tough thing. It's it, you feel good, boy. That feels good to tweet, right? Sure but, does. But Absolutely. but but eighteen months later, when that kid finally steps on campus and you know makes it through the fall, or maybe makes it through half the fall. Right, I'm I'm thinking of a specific example, not not too far from me, that just announced. Um, I'm like I'm like scratching my head. How do they even have the audacity to announce this? They just announced their 24 freshmen. Like, welcome to campus, meet our freshmen, and there's 24 of them. Gosh. And you and you and you and you go wait, how many? And and then you go, well, how many guys? Or how many guys total are there? Forty-two. So there's forty-two guys on campus in the fall, and you're going. I wonder if how many of these they can only keep thirty-five. Hey, well, that's what I was going to say. How many of these forty-two are like in the dark that there's seven dudes who have to be gone pretty soon? Like, I bet there's a few of these kids who don't even recognize that. Or, or maybe they know, but they're like, ah, it's not going to be me. You right. know, all it may, maybe coach maybe. told me, coach told me that, you know, I'm yeah. a staple of this program. Yeah. And it's, um, yeah, 42 dudes. And, and listen, I, and that's a big, that's a big program. I, I know, I know mid majors, obviously you, you have to, you bring in, it's all oftentimes you bring in more. I get that. But, um, but yeah, that's a lot of dudes. That's a lot of dudes for, you know, for for going into the fall um you know i can i can understand a big class but 24 in one class Ooh. wow what That's happened large. what happened um yeah um yeah man the you, you know then you you also you also talked about fit that's that's definitely a pet peeve of mine i i think i think that and not enough kids understand what that means. Not enough parents understand what that means. And if you want to understand what 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 best fit means, it means getting away from the baseball field and getting boots on the ground of the actual yep. campus. That's the best tip I can give any family. Okay, every baseball field in the country is exactly the same. It's ninety feet from home to first. It's sixty feet six inches to the mound. Um, it, it, it's they have dugouts. They even get to wear uniforms. But it's once you once you cross the foul lines and, and you head into the campus, that's where things become very different, very different. One school to the next, to the next, to the next. And, you, you know, one of the huge advantages of this current travel ball setup that we're in is that we're placing kids in events on college campuses every single weekend. Every single weekend. And so they have the opportunity to get boots on the ground, but I see it all the time. Listen, without throwing any of your guys under the bus, you probably see it where you travel a good distance to go play at a place. Maybe it's a once a year or once a lifetime opportunity. And the field is right here. The campus is right here. And you know that some of these families never cross the sidewalk. And you're scratching your head going, wait, guys, you have this unique opportunity Walk around the campus, poke your head into some dorm rooms, poke your head into some classrooms, stop some of the students and have a conversation. Do you, do you see an older person? That's probably a professor. Maybe talk to them for a few minutes. Um, that's how you get to really figure out uh, what best fit is. The baseball part is just part of it. It's one part of it. But you're, you're going to be living your life much more 
off the baseball field than on the baseball field. And when, when, when folks can figure that out, the sooner they can figure that out, the better off they're going to be. And guess what? That's going to lower that bounce back rate that you described. The, the portal right now, this transfer portal, portal is overflowing with players who showed up at places that they apparently weren't good a good fit at. If they were a good fit, they wouldn't be trying to transfer. That's um, right. So, anywho, I go I go off on a tangent here. Um, listen, we've got we got a handful of other topics to hit, but I want to be respectful of your time. How how are you doing? Do you have anywhere We're to good. run, or we got a few minutes? Yeah, we got time. Okay. Um, so we listen. We've talked. Um, we've talked about the older guys. We've talked about. I want to talk a little bit. You you had mentioned you want to talk about uh, the younger guys a little bit, and I want to get to that. But I do I do want to ask you one more question on the older guys while we're while we've been talking about it. You just got back um, from Arizona, and we were talking about this before we hit record. Huge event out there. It's uh it's it's a Wilson event, and the very first thing that jumped into my head was that's a heck of a long way from Florida. Talk to me about the motivation for going out there, what exactly this event is, um, and does it move the needle? So t- tell me where you were, what it was, and, sure. and, and, t- and describe this event that you were at. Yeah, so this, this past weekend, um, we took our 2022 team and our 2020 team uh, to Arizona which was a Wilson premier um, tournament, which, which is Ostingers is a Wilson prime team, um, which means basically that we wear Wilson, DeMarini, Louisville Slugger. I don't know how many people actually know that Wilson owns mm-hmm. Evo. Wilson owns Louisville Slugger. Wilson owns um, DeMarini, you know, so, and there's a couple other, you know, companies that Wilson owns, but, um, being a Wilson premier team, um, those teams, you know, they, they Wilson company kind of seeks out programs throughout the country that are Wilson teams that they feel like would represent their brand. Well, um, you know, we've been fortunate enough to, you know, excel at the national stage for long enough that they came to me and, you know, it's something close and dear to my heart. I'm I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. You mm-hmm. know, Louisville Slugger, Bullock, and Bradsby. So, you know, it was pretty it was a pretty good fit for us. Um, but the but the tournament is basically their top twenty teams in the country, um, their top twenty programs in the country. They go to Arizona every other year, and every other year that it's not in Arizona, it's in West Palm Beach, Florida. So, um, we travel there every other year, and then. You know, those teams that are West Coast travel to, to West Palm every other year, um, which just kind of turns out to be, you know, the best of the best, honestly. Um, it's a very small setting. So, you know, at, at the age groups, you know, there's only 20 teams in each age group, which is very different than, you know, some of the larger programs that mm-hmm. go and you have teams in a week week-long event so if a college coach shows up at that event he knows that those 20 teams they're all extremely talented baseball teams which is a positive for the coaches the second positive for the coaches is all the all the games are in one location um which i understand why they do what they do for the large large uh tournaments but you know when you when you have a tournament with 20 teams and every single team is good you know, I think that that's more beneficial for the good teams and the coaches. So yeah. um, that was kind of the event. The Wilson Premier is what it's called. Um, in the fall, they have the Wilson Premier event that are that's just for um, Wilson Premier teams. And then in the summertime in Auburndale, Florida, which is just outside Lakeland, um, they have a – each week they have one age group per week. Um, which is a much larger event, and anyone can go to that event, um, which is another very quality, well-run event. Um, so, 
you know, we, we played the Evo Shield Canes at the 2020 level, which is the number one team, you know, rated the number one team in the country. We played um, the San Diego Show, which is mm-hmm. uh, probably a top five program in the country. Um, so, you know, yes, is Arizona far? 100% it's far. Mm-hmm. Um, have kids that may not want to go to the West Coast to play? We do. Um, the positive for my program is, my kids go everywhere to play. You know, we have kids in North Carolina and Georgia and, you know, Tennessee and Missouri and Virginia, which is still not down the street from Arizona. But, you know, I think that it's a, it's a positive for them to get out, you know, to understand, Hey, I'm missing two days of school. You know, I got to bring my homework with me. Um, This is how it's going to be in college. You know, I'm going to miss days of school when we leave to get, you know, get on an airplane or get in a bus and drive to the city that we're going to play for three days. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's a learning experience for the players, um, you know, to, to understand the lifestyle. Um, it's, it's, it's a great experience for the players because they're playing the best players in the country. Um, and then they realize, you know what, we're pretty, we're pretty good. Um, we're, we're right there. We're competing with the top teams in the country. We are a top team in the country. And that just, to me, that promotes that confidence to know, you know, Hey, I can do this. So for all those reasons, that's, you know, kind of one of the reasons we go to Arizona is, you know, a a multi faceted reason, um, to go, you you know, and, and the reality is at this point that that's a, that's an event specifically aimed at the top teams from the top organizations, which means college coaches are going to go where those players are. They could host this thing in Alaska and college coaches would show up. And so my presumption is, is that many organizations, even East coast organizations probably got on a plane and flew out there. So as you were walking around, I'm I'm sure you saw ACC schools out there. You saw SEC schools out there. Absolutely. Duke, yeah. Michigan, you know, yeah. you name some of the teams, they were there for sure. Yeah. yeah Cause it, it, if, if they're not there, you know, then, then they might be missing out. Um, interesting. Will this, this Wilson, this Wilson event and what Wilson's doing um, on the baseball side in the last few years has been, has been impressive to watch. So that's cool that you're getting to participate um, in that. Um, well, right on cool stuff, man. I, I did want to give you an opportunity and go backwards and talk about, we've talked about your older age groups, but, um, you know, I want to hear about what's going on at the youth level and, you know, what, what, what has you excited about that or what maybe has you uh, concerned about youth, uh, about the youth level travel baseball. So what's, what's going on down with these, uh, with the little guys? Yeah. So, I mean, Several things. I, I, you know, I, I kind of joke with parents and say, you know, until you get to the big field, a lot of what we do is make believe, you know, these kids, you know, and, and my, you know, my 12 year old team included, you know, we'll we'll go to Cooperstown next summer Mm -hmm. and, you know, be participate in that week long event. And, you know, those are memories that these kids will take with them the rest of their life and they'll trade pins and they'll, you know, do all those things that, that is part of growing up. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, hundred percent agree with doing those things. Um, you know, but you know, my my best friend back home um, in Louisville sent me a, a screenshot of a game changer score this weekend, and he coaches his son who's on a nine U team, oh. and they played against a kid who threw a hundred and sixty four pitches oh, no. in a game. Uh, you know, so it's things it's, you know, it, it's a two edged sword. You know, you, you want to see kids grow and develop, but you know, then you, then every kid becomes a travel ball player. And then you get crazy things like that, you know, where they're chasing a trophy at nine years old. And because this kid is, you know, I don't, I don't know how you can be dominating when you throw 164 pitches in a six inning game. But I mean, there had to be a ton of walks in there somewhere. Um, But, you know, I feel like parents and coaches get into this, 
they forget about teaching how to play the game the right way and, you know, the kids learning to play the game the right way. And they only worry about how many trophies they have at the end of the day. And I, I want to win as much, if not more, as the next guy. But yeah. I don't feel like I'm ever going to put a kid's health in jeopardy to win a trophy mm-hmm. at nine years old. At the end of the day, nobody's going to remember what you did at nine. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, I tell parents and coaches that are in my program, you know, I, I feel like there's three things that need to happen between eight and 12. And to me, those three things are learn the game the right way. You know, obviously, if you get to the big field and you haven't learned how to play the game the right way, when you get to the big field, the learning curve is extremely steep. Um, And for some, they don't ever catch up. Mm -hmm. The second thing that I think is imperative is they have to love the game. Mm. You know, um, my coaches joke with me all the time. I put in Florida, you can play every weekend. You could play 52 weeks a year. Yeah. Um, But for my program, I put parameters on you can only play during between this date and this date mm-hmm. and between this date and this date. You have to take off. They can't play at all, yeah. um, which is not really what a lot of these programs do. Mm-hmm. Um, so the parents are probably the biggest culprits of that. You know, they enjoy the weekends. They enjoy going to the tournaments. They enjoy staying in the hotels and taking mini vacations, mm-hmm. you know, at the expense of their kid. And their kid, you know, is dragging, you know, trying to keep up in school and, you know, leaving every Friday and going and staying in hotels. And, you know, by the end of the season, they're, they're dog tired. Yeah. So th- then they, they fall out of love with the game of baseball. You know, at some point they loved it, you know, but they, they're so tired of it by the time they get to 12 or 13 or 14, you know, we lose a lot of players because they're just over it. So second rule of thumb for me on the little field is the player has to love the game. Mm -hmm. And then the third, the third kind of rule of thumb in my point is they have to be healthy, you know, Mm -hmm. which kind of goes back to my point with 164 pitches for a nine-year-old, you know, they, you know, if, if they're healthy, if they love the game and they, they know how to play the game, those three things, when they get to the big field, they have a chance to be successful when it, when it starts to count. Um, you know, and if, if they only have two, two of the three pieces of that puzzle, they're, they're not going to make it. They're not going to succeed, whether that succession, you know, is in college or in high school or in pro ball. At some point, you know, if they don't love the game, at some point, they're going to drop off. Mm-hmm. If they're hurt, at some point, they're going to drop off. Yeah. If they don't know how to play the game, at some point, they're going to drop off. So, you know, that's that's kind of my um, – it's a, This is my awesome. Talk, gold. This is gold. Know, that's kind of my talk to the, to, to the parents and to the coaches each year that we have tryouts, each season. You know, when we get, get together again, you know, I kind of remind the coaches, you know, rem, you know at these younger ages, you know, we, we definitely want to promote winning. We, we want to win. We want to teach kids how to be winners. We also need to teach them how to lose correctly, yeah. you know, um, be, be good sports. But, you know, we, we, we need to have those three things. We need to be healthy. We need to have them loving the game, and they need to know how to play it. So that's my two cents on the little guys. Um, Tremendous. You know, I feel like we, we, we lose a lot in the, in the big – picture but if you kind of narrow it down into those three rules of thumb i think you kind of capture a lot of the things that we're missing at the younger ages yeah that's that's good stuff man learn love and stay healthy i love it yeah. i you know i again i'm i'm not kind of in the trenches in the in the youth um travel ball world and i just sort of see it through uh, through friends of mine who have you know, eight year olds and nine year olds, and I'm scratching my head thinking it, isn't this just little league with higher expenses? Um, you, you know, it's like they're, they're eight year olds and you got to go 
down two states away and get hotels to play games when we got all these good teams right here in town? What, what What's that all about? So, so I, I'm very weary about um, that really young group. You know, it's like just stay here in town, have fun, and hit the playground when the game's done. They're eight. You, you know yeah. what I mean? Play the game. There's plenty of competition right here in our town, and you could say that about – any town in the country. There's plenty of eight year olds and nine year olds playing playing baseball. And uh, when the game's over, you head over to Chuck E. Cheese and you get some pizza. Like to to have to go down and get two nights of hotels so that you can play baseball games for eight year olds seems really backwards to me. Um, I don't know if I'm the only one who thinks that way, um, but but yeah, it's it's one thing to lose an afternoon for the entire family to go play you know for your eight-year-old to go play baseball that's another thing to lose an entire weekend so your kid can go play baseball at eight you um so yeah yeah wild stuff man listen this is this is this has been fun let me ask you we we spoke a little bit about at the very beginning about you know the question about your growth and if you're you know i I know it's something that's going to be uh kind of top of mind over the next year or two for for you but what else are you focused on? Is there anything else that, that right now, um, you know, that you're putting some emphasis on, whether whether it's internally for, for O Stingers Academy or something you're focused on for your players? How, how, do you, how do you approach that question? What are you focused on? Um, I mean, you know, you, you always, you know, you work so hard to feel like, you know, I want to, I want to make it to the top. I want to make it to the top. And then I feel like a lot of people, you know, get close or get to the top. And then it's like, Oh, now I got to take a deep breath and kick my heel, you know, kick my shoes off and put my feet up on the, Mm -hmm. on the chair and just kind of sit back and relax. And then two years later, you look at it and go, gosh, man, you know, I was up there and now I'm back down where I, you know, where I started. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think for me, it's your program's only as good as your players. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I feel like for me, I, I do, I don't go out and recruit players, um, which is probably why I'm on a smaller scale mm-hmm. um, than a lot of programs. Um, I just, I feel like, you know, if you want to play for Ostingers and you want to play for, you know, a guy that's going to push you and make you better and you're going to have practice and that sort of thing. I feel like you're going to seek us out. Um, so maybe just do a little bit better of marketing mm-hmm. of the program so that people understand, you know, what we are about. Um, I think at the Academy, um, I have a former major leaguer who caught in the major leagues for 15 years. His name's Mike Heath. He caught in the the eighties and early nineties. And he's a little older and, you know, he, he always jokes, you know, the guys that played at a, a very high level, we don't really talk about ourselves much. Mm. You know, it's the guys who played quote unquote semi pro ball oh. that want to talk about how great they are, <laughs> you know, but at yeah. the end of the day, what is semi pro baseball? So um, probably, you know, at the forefront, I probably am working on individually slash program wide doing a better job of marketing who we are, what we are, why we are, what we are, mm-hmm. um, you know, possibly growing the facility just a little bit would be nice. Um, and then on the very close short term goal arena. Um, and this is something I feel like we've done a very good job of over the last year or so is just really promoting kids and their overall health. You know, making sure that they're eating right, making sure that they're getting their proper rest and then teaching them how to get in the weight room and be successful in the weight room. You know, when you have these three or four months off between the end of fall and the start of high school season, you know, you in four months, I mean, you can get a lot done. Yeah. So um, I, I feel like, you know, short term wise, just really pushing the players to, you know, get in the weight room learn how to learn how to lift and learn how to get stronger and teach your body how to be fast twitch muscle, you know, versus 
being a bodybuilder and you know looking good in the mirror you know i feel like yeah. the education of that is something that i try to do as a program uh, facilitator and then you know long term wise just growing the facility promoting the program marketing yeah. marketing what we do a little bit better yeah you know that the your short term goal as far as the, the the player health and development is a is an interesting one for me the the getting bigger faster and stronger the getting in the weight room i feel like that's that was like a secret that got unlocked you know maybe in the early 2000s we started realizing hey hitting hitting the weight room kind of kind of helps and then and then it was a, a little while longer uh we realized this nutrition thing kind of went hand in hand with it and now all of a sudden recently we we seem to have uh realized how important the sleep and the rest is because when you're you know when you're when you're in the weight room and you're working on your skill set and you're breaking down your muscles well the the best performance enhancing drug out there is rest it's the best thing Absolutely. out there but the teenagers have the biggest obstacle because they're on every single app you know now they're on snapchat <laughs> yep. and tiktok and facebook and twitter and instagram and and probably 50 others that i don't know the names of and you know i'm just thinking as a here's something you might want to try to do you might, there also are apps that track sleep how about this you te test test this out get get everybody on the same sleep app and have weekly check-ins hey how, how's your sleep you know you can set it as a goal let's let's try and get all our players asleep by 11 o'clock you know because because i know that there's kids out there who are on their phones until two o'clock in the morning texting with buddies oh, yeah. and and snapchatting or with playing their, video games or playing video games or whatever it is and then you got to get up these kids got to get up early because high school starts early and now they're at a they're at a sleep deficiency and then you do that again, and then you do it another day in a row, and then you do it a seventh day in a row, and now you're dragging. Now you're dragging big time. And and that, that hurts you mentally or hurts you physically. That'd be something interesting. And, you know, I don't know how you do it, but get, get, get everybody on the same sleep app, set it as a goal, and say, hey, let's see if we can get everybody to sleep by whatever time. You know, pick a time, you know, 11 o'clock. And let's let's see how many nights in a row we can we can do this individually. Let's see how – what, what the percentage of guys we can do this for, you know, a day, a week, a month. And then also, you know, check in with them on how they're feeling. Um, gosh, I mean, you're only going to feel better. You know, if you're used to yeah, staying up till two, two playing, um, playing video games or Snapchatting, and then you start getting to sleep at 11, I mean, talk, that's, that's the best performance enhancing drug ever made right there. You know, it Agreed. used to, and you can't catch up on sleep. No, you cannot. And it, you know, it's used to be this badge of honor. You see this in uh, if you if you follow. You know, obviously, I, I love baseball, but but the the entrepreneur um, uh, in me loves following sort of the the online entrepreneurs and following their journeys. And it used to be a badge of honor that you worked a hundred hours a week, and now the tide has turned, and where people are realizing that a full night's sleep is so valuable and a midday nap might be valuable for some people. So it's, it's interesting to see that I actually just saw, who was it? I think it was Verlander. I got, I got to pull this up. I think it was Verlander who said that he was telling, um, um, uh, uh, Bregman that the biggest secret I gotta find. I think it was in Sports Illustrated. I, may, I might be attributing that to the wrong article, but um, he told him the biggest thing you can do right now is go sleep ten hours a night. You know, because Bregman, he's just young. I did guy. see that somewhere. He's a young guy. Hey, he's got yeah. you know, he's hot. Yeah. He's hot. He's the hot. He's the hot commodity. He's the yeah. he's the man about about town. He's the big big guy on campus. It'd be very easy for a guy like him to fall into a routine because of you you know a big leaguer doesn't need to get to the yard at at 8 a.m., you get there a little later, right? Um, and so that means I can sleep in. That means I can go to sleep later. Well, that's right. not necessarily the right way to approach it, um, especially when you're when you're when your biggest asset is your body. 
and you have to maintain that health. Um, cool stuff, man. I, I like I like the way that this uh, this discussion kind of went a bunch of different directions. This was a lot of fun, um, Jim. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it here uh, so that hopefully a lot of people listened all the way to the end. If they're still listening, all this will be uh, posted up over at PlayInSchool dot com slash Osting and the links to your Twitter, which is at Ostinger Academy, as well as the links to your website, which is ostingbaseball.com, will all be there. I should probably start saying this at the very beginning of of these calls instead of at the very end. But hang on one second. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording. I'm gonna stop the episode, man. This was this was awesome. Do you have any parting words? No, I just greatly appreciate you having me on. It's an honor. Um, you know, I I respect my position in, in what I do and how I do it. And, and it's nice to kind of be um, in the conversation. So I greatly appreciate you having me on. You got it, man. This has been, this has been fun for me, you know, and, and the whole, the whole point of travel ball talk is to, is to try to introduce as many of these organizations to the, to the rest of the community. And, and I'm still, I'm still learning about good, good organizations. And some of them are humongous and really awesome from top to bottom. And some of them are literally standalone teams and uh, you know, there's no right way or wrong way to do it. So it's, so it's fun to get to get to talk to all these different kind of guys and get to learn from everybody. And you know what? I'm not, I don't run a travel ball organization. So it's uh, hopefully it's valuable for those people who are running them and they can take a, take away one little nugget. So hang tight real quick. I'm just going to stop, stop the recording. I'm having so much fun bringing these shows to you each week. If you'd like to recommend a coach for the show, please don't hesitate to shoot me a note at rich at playinschool.com or DM me on Twitter at playinschool. Again, my name is Rich Prado. I'm the founder of Play In School. My goal is to continue to create products and services that add value to you, the travel ball coaches, your players, and their parents. Visit playinschool.com to see some of the ways we're doing that. Or better yet, let's set up a call. Until next time, thank you for listening to Travel Ball Talk.